And the Buddha gave his first instructions to Rahula. He was teaching Rahula a basic principle of wisdom, discernment. He was judging what things are worth doing and what things are not. That principle applies all the way through the practice. And the answers are going to get more refined as we go through the practice. But it's always important that we keep that in mind. The mind is primarily active. The passage we chanted just now talked about the eye and the ear and the nose and the tongue and the body being on fire. Well, they're not on fire on their own. They're on fire because of the mind. The things we see, the things we hear and smell, they're on fire because of what we're looking for. We're constantly out looking for something. After all, this mind is attached to this body that needs to feed. Yet it lives in its actions. It doesn't really see them. Which is why the first principle of wisdom is learning how to step back, look at your actions, look at your intentions to begin with, because that's where the action begins. And ask yourself, where is this going? The Buddha would then give you various instructions on what was worth going with and what was not. In the beginning, it was simply, if it's going to harm you, harm others, don't do it. And the Four Noble Truths basically take that principle, take it further. Look into the mind. Is it worth causing suffering for yourself? And the answer is that in some cases it is, if the suffering is the suffering involved with the path. Because everything that's fabricated involves some stress. In every state of becoming, where you take on an identity in a particular world of experience, that's going to involve some stress and suffering too. And you need to do that in order to create the path. So those are areas that are worth doing, actions that are worth doing. As for the actions that lead to suffering, the different types of craving, those are not. So we've got a principle here. The, the Buddha said his main duty as a teacher was to give us a sense of what should and should not be done. And he takes it through many different levels of subtlety. In the level that's blatant enough for a young boy to understand, all the way to the final acts of the arahant or the person about to be an arahant. There's a question of what to do, what to hold on to, what to let go of. And it's a selective letting go. If you let go all at once from the very beginning, as John Lee says, you let go like a pauper. You don't have your car, you don't have your wealth. You say, well, just let go of them. Yeah, but you don't have them to use. And you can't do anything with that letting go. Or as the wise person learns how to develop that wealth, and then knows not to carry it around. It's there when you need it, and you can share it with others. The pauper who lets go can't have anything to share with others at all, but the wise person who's developed good qualities develop good skills, can share them. So the amount of stress and suffering that goes into following the path, it's really worth it. Just make sure you don't get waylaid, particularly with sensuality. There are four kinds of clinging, clinging to sensuality, habits and practices, views, and ideas of the self. And of the th four, three of them actually have a role to play on the path, but sensuality doesn't. Sensuality, of course, is the mind's fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. Lustful thoughts, or simply thoughts about food, clothing, shelter. How you like this to be that way and that to be this way. And the amount of time we spend fantasizing about these things, dressing them up before and after. This keeps pulling the mind in the wrong direction, gives us the wrong idea of what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. As for habits and practices, anything that's in line with the path, something you should hold on to. 
when you're practicing concentration, there is a holding on. I read a book a while back. Sad thing was written by a monk, saying that because effort and concentration require that you be dedicated and have a strong sense of motivation and think about yourself in the future and benefiting from this, it all involves a sense of self. It all involves all that work to build that habit. We know the Buddha said a self, sense of self is bad, so you shouldn't try to create concentration. The right effort is basically the effort of no effort, which short-circuits the path entirely. Again, you're letting go like a pauper. You don't have concentration, so you let it go. These are habits we need, because as you get the mind to settle down, you learn a lot about it that you wouldn't learn otherwise. You see subtle things moving around that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. It's like casting a light down into a, into a murky pool. And you begin to see, you know, there are little animals down there that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. So whatever clinging, whatever stress is needed to get the mind in a good, solid concentration and keep it there, it's all to the good. It's all worth it. Right view is worth holding on to. Right view about the precepts, about the Dharma and the Vinaya, about the practice. These are the things you have to hold on to. And as for your sense of self, there are times when it's very, very useful to have a sense of self. As we're developing the path, you have to have that sense of one, on the one hand, being capable that you can do it, and two, that you're going to benefit from it. Otherwise, the mind is not going to be doing any of the practices. You may find that your sense of self peels away as the different parts of the path get perfected. That stream entry, the, your virtue is perfected, and so you don't have to have any sense of yourself around your, your virtues. You're not, you don't exalt yourself over others. You don't create a sense of who you are around the precepts. They're just there. But there's still other parts of the path you have to work on, which is why they say there's a lingering sense of self all the way up to our hardship. Because you still have to develop your concentration, you still have to develop your discernment. So the work of developing there does require a state of becoming. In Pali, this is obvious. Bhavana, bhava. Bhava is becoming, bhavana is developing, or the word for meditation. So we'll, we'll take an identity on, but you take it on when it's worth it. You let it go when it's done its duty. So all the way through, you're making value judgments as to what's worth doing, what's not. Four Noble Truths are value judgments. The three characteristics are used in the context of the Four Noble Truths to help you see clearly when you're doing something that's not really in your best interest and how you can stop. But as for the parts of the path you still have to develop, you still need to have some clinging, some even some conceit, as they say, the conceit, the sense that I can do this. And you hold on to the path. Remember the image of the raft. You go across the river. You don't let go of the raft until you're on the other side. Which means that when you're doing concentration like this, you really do have to hold on to your object. You can't let the sense of comfort that arises lift you away. As the breath gets more and more subtle, you still have to stay with the sense of the body. Remember, your awareness of the body, even though it seems still, is a kind of energy. Your awareness of the solidity and the warmth and the coolness in the body all get filtered through your sense of the breath energy, which is why as the sense of comfort grows in the meditation. You should try to expand your awareness to fill the body and maintain that perception. Because that's what keeps you in proper concentration, it keeps you alert. In fact, all the way through the different states of jhana, you have to hold on to that perception of your object. You can't let it go. 
simply that your sense of what it is, the sense of the breath, will go more and more refined. Even here, there's a value judgment. What kind of breathing is worth doing? What kind of breathing, after all, gets too heavy, too gross? Gross in the sense of being too strong. And when is it right to do strong breathing? You're perfecting your powers of judgment. That's what discernment is all about. And you can finally get to a place where you don't have to judge anything anymore. You've arrived. Because the powers of judgment are there to decide, what should I do next? What should I do next? Which is this question that eats, eats, eats away at the back of the mind. And you finally get to a point where you can let that question go. Then there's no need for judgment. But then it's obvious that what you found is really worth it. It was worth all the effort that went into the path. So trying to be conscious of the fact that you are passing judgment and the fact that you're making distinctions between what's skillful and what's not, what's worthwhile and what's not. This is not delusion. Some people will tell you that when you're thinking, it's delusion. When the mind's not thinking, it's not deluded. Well, the mind, when it's not thinking, can be extremely deluded. But if it's thinking rightly, it can keep itself on the path. So starting with the teachings of Turahula, what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. Try to use the Buddhist teachings to give yourself better and better answers.